We knew it was coming, everyone. The carousel is in full motion. It is Black Sunday as uh, we encounter and experience every year in college football, coaches, firings, and hirings, and the domino effect is underway. Welcome into the Voice of College Football, breaking down the game we all love each and every day with you. And it will be the best in discussion, debate, and analysis if you take part. We have left the link there in the chat, also in the description section of the video, as we do in every video or attempt to. Amazon links also in the description section. So Christmas is coming. That's what I understand. It's about a month away, almost exactly a month away and counting. So when you do your Amazon shopping, please use the link that we provide in the description section. Amazon is worth a reported $1.8 trillion. We are worth slightly less than that here at the Voice of College Football. Therefore, your purchase at Amazon then gets split between ourselves and Amazon. We keep 98%. They get 2%. No, it's something close to that. All right. Also, keep in mind that uh, our top 25 that actually makes sense is on the streets. It is out there. It is being talked about. Folks are in an uproar. They are rejoicing. They are doing all of that and in between. Top 25, that actually makes sense. Check it out. Leave your comments. Also uh, posted a video that I had some fun with earlier today on the Miami channel. So you've got to go to the Miami channel. Ran into some, um, some folks who are a bit demented from the Miami Hurricane fan base, but that's not unusual. For any fan base, of course. We know that already. So I just gave them a bit of a reminder to be a fan. Be a fan. Just don't be a dumb fan. And uh, we just uh, posted a video on Dana Hogerson and his ouster at Houston with Steve Helwick from SB Nation. Check that video out. We discussed the primary candidates for the job that are being bantied about on social media and from beat writers that are the typical candidates that you would expect for a job in the Big 12 at Houston. A couple of candidates in particular, but we delved a little bit deeper than that. Steve definitely put together some connections of some coaches that may not be talked about on the surface for the Houston vacancy, but make a lot of sense. So check out the video there. And again, Let's start right there with Dana Hogerson. Fired at Houston after five seasons, 31 and 28. Four and eight this season, two and seven in the Big 12. It was a rough go for Dana Hogerson in transitioning from the American Conference, where he had good success, not great success, considering Houston should win in the American Conference, always has won since being demoted from a Power five, not that that's what we called it at the time, but a Southwest Conference member and a fine football tradition down into the group of five ranks, but uh, could not elevate into the Big 12. But then again, look at UCF, look at BYU, look at Cincinnati. It's been difficult for all four of them to adjust play into the Big 12. Two wins in the conference this year for Dana Hogerson. One was a win against Baylor, who's probably the worst team in the Big 12. And the other one was a miracle Hail Mary by Donovan Smith at the gun against West Virginia at home. Otherwise, seven losses in the Big 12. Most of them were routes. They did have a nice win against uh, Texas San Antonio early in the season, but they also lost against Rice. And so Dana Hogerson going to be paid a handsome $14.8 million by the University of Houston to move on. So again, we talked about Willie Fritz, Tulane, Jeff Trailer, Texas San Antonio, and some other less known, less thought of candidates for the opening at Houston. Going to the Big Ten, Indiana, as expected, had this conversation last night that uh, Indiana would fire Tom Allen. I was about 99% sure of that. And they went ahead and pulled the trigger after seven seasons Think back, if this were just three seasons ago, Tom Allen had gone eight and five, came within two touchdowns 
a two touchdown lead in the fourth quarter of defeating Tennessee in the Gator Bowl in 2019, could have had a nine and four season and then turned around and during the COVID year gave Ohio State a scare, almost went to the Big Ten championship game, finished close to the top 10 in the nation. Number 12, I believe, was the final ranking at six and two. Best finish for IU football since going to the Rose Bowl in 1967, but they have been atrocious, horrible, horrendous. IU football has been just incredibly bad since then. Should have lost to Akron, the Akron Zips, who only have one win in the MAC. Could have converted a field goal to beat Indiana. Indiana has been atrocious. It's time for Tom Allen to go. He is not up to the challenge. Excellent defensive coordinator, and that's probably what he'll be at his next stop. Three and 24 in the Big Ten the last three years. And this pays off handsomely as well. $15.5 million for Tom Allen. The original buyout clause was $20.8 million. However he can go get himself another job. So it was bargained down to 15.5 million, according to reports on ESPN, but he can now go get himself another job and make another income. So do what you will, Tom, you can uh, go take a few cruises around the world for the next few years. I think you can afford that, or you can draw two salaries at the same time. It looks like you got too much energy to go on the cruise. All right. Uh, defensive coordinator, obviously, under Kevin Wilson before he got the job at Indiana. Louisiana Monroe has fired Terry Bowden. I got to say, I kind of forgot that Terry Bowden was at Louisiana Monroe. All 13 people care. But anyway, 2-10 and 10 this last season, 10-26. and 26. Terry Bowden, of course, once upon a time, the coach of the Auburn Tigers and a successful coach with Auburn. Finished in the top 25, finished ranked all six seasons, finished in the top 10 his first two years at Auburn. He was one of the toasts of college football back in the early 90s, 11-0 in 1993. Then, of course, they had some sanction issues. And they went to the SEC championship game in 97. Then he just kind of disappeared after a long stint with ABC. Many of you remember those Saturday afternoons with John Saunders and Terry Bowden at halftime on the ABC set. Then he came back with Akron, went to North Alabama first. Akron took the zips to a MAC championship game, but could not do much with Louisiana Monroe. So he's out of a job. All right. And then UTEP and Dana Dimmel part ways after six seasons. He had lifted one of the worst programs. In the history of college football, UTEP is one of the most inept programs that's ever been created. 20 and 49 actually is horrible, but it's not nearly as horrible as they've been. And he went to a bowl game two years ago, which was a minor miracle. So Dana Dimmel, he'll get back into coaching. And of course, he will have uh, a spot somewhere. And now the hirings. Mississippi State, Jeff Levy. No big surprise there. That's been bantied about in recent days. Most recently, Oklahoma offensive coordinator. The Sooners are top five to six in the nation in most categories. Jeff Levy is considered one of the best offensive minds in college football. He is the most 50-point games in the last three seasons. Of course, he's worked with Art Bryles for a long time, 2008. To 14 at Baylor. Learned a lot from Art Bryles. You could insert a joke there or two, but we'll stick to football. Josh Heupel, of course, at UCF before he went to Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin. And now, uh, since Dan Mullen left in 2017, we've seen a number of coaches at Mississippi State, and Mike Leach was starting to gain traction, had a 9-4 and four season. God rest his soul, rest in peace, Mike Leach. Hated to see that, of course. That was a tragic situation. Zach Arnett thrust into a difficult situation, won the bowl game, but uh, Mississippi State moved on from him after just 11 games 
this season, one win in the SEC. And so now we've got Jeff Levy, difficult place to win. Although Dan Mullen pulled it off, Jackie Sherrill pulled it off. And Mike Leach was starting to gain ground there. So it's it's possible, it's doable, but two more difficult programs to deal with in the SEC, of course, starting next season. And then finally, we've got Texas A&M, the big splash, the big news of the day, hiring Mike Elko. It's still just being reported, but it's been confirmed all over the place. It's not been announced officially, but Mike Elko to Texas A&M. Of course, uh, Mike Elko, one of the great defensive minds, college football defensive coordinator under Jimbo Fisher at AM. Also worked at Wake Forest, Fordham, Bowling Green. So he's used to doing more with less. And so was the case at Duke. What he was able to accomplish in less than two short seasons at Duke is utterly remarkable. I've talked about it many times here. Duke, David Cutcliffe did a nice job. Horrible program. He took it over, raised it to seven to eight win status. But over the last five or six years under David Cutcliffe, Duke had declined back into the mess, back into the mire, back into the bottom of college football in the power five. Mike Elko, this is remarkable when you take somebody else's players that could not win. They were one and 17 in the ACC and ACC games, 17 of 18 losses under David Cutcliffe before Mike Elko arrived. So he's taking the exact same players other than of course, his freshman recruiting class, which he was not able to recruit until he stepped in the building at the beginning of December. So not necessarily his class, just trying to maintain David Cutcliffe's final class. And he immediately, bam, nine and four bowl victory. Didn't lose any of those four games by more than one score. Should have been playing in the ACC championship game if it wasn't for most likely a bad holding call that negated a touchdown that would have taken a late lead against North Carolina. They lose to North Carolina. That is the only thing that separated Duke in 2022 from playing in the ACC championship game. Good start this year at 4-0. Of course, they had the big win against Clemson on opening night. They took Notre Dame to the wire, had a fourth and 16. If the defense would have shut it down there, 5-0 for Duke. But uh, lost that game to Notre Dame. Riley Leonard got hurt against Florida State. They had a lead in that game late in the third quarter against Florida State on the road. That's how good Duke has been this year. Now they started to lose some games Obviously, once Riley Leonard got hurt and uh, still not a complete program, didn't have time to build it, to supplement the talent, to build the roster. But seven and five for Duke after they won this past weekend against Pitt. So Mike Elko takes over the spot of Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M. All right, folks, uh, leave your comments and questions there in the chat. Super Chat's available as well. Actually, the most impactful way, I will say it that way, to support us here at the Voice of College Football is Venmo, PayPal, and Cash App. But of course, we appreciate the Super Chat contributions. All of you have been so kind. All right, let's get to the phone lines here at the Voice of College Football. We've got uh, Jackson here. Jackson, what's going on tonight? Oh, it's going pretty good, Mark. How you doing tonight? I'm good. What's going on? <laughs> well, I will say it doesn't it doesn't surprise me that Dana Holgerson was canned. I mean, especially not only after the four and eight season they had in the debut season of the Big Twelve, but I think what also led up to it was the disappointing last season in the AAC, where they were expected to do so much more than eight and five. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No big surprise there. Uh, I, I don't believe that Houston wants to see themselves falling further and further behind in a situation where they know that they already had a big challenge in front of them trying to adapt the roster and everything to Big 12 play. Yeah, well, 
Another thing I thought about was the school president, uh, R Renu Kator, I believe that's her name. She said something when hiring Major Applewhite in 2016 that if you go eight and four, you're out of here. I don't know if that rule still applies to the Big 12, but I guess we'll wait and see. Well, yes, we will wait and see. I would think, though, that it does not apply. Otherwise, we're going to have a new Houston coach about every season. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of the Cleveland Browns at one point when they had every coach every year. It, it was just, oh, good grief. Yes, that was a mess at one point. Oh, yeah. Well, and I see that Dave Aranda got that vote of confidence. And it looks like we're waiting for official writing on the wall on what happens with uh, Chip Kelly because they got smacked by California last night. So it's just, I don't know if he's keeping his job, but I think they're just being quiet for now. They're waiting it out for Tuesday. I, I've seen this happen a few times where they kind of just waited it out a couple days to make an announcement. Yeah, I don't know why. They would be waiting it out. But uh, I do think that Chip Kelly's gone. Yeah. I don't know that. I don't have any inside information. Uh, I do know that uh, Tony Siracusa told us from last word on college football a few weeks ago that he believed that Chip Kelly was gone, and he certainly has inside sources. But then that was kind of backed off on to a certain extent that he beat USC and could have finished eight and four, but to lose to Cal at home by 26 points. Mm. And on the last regular season in the history of the Pat 12, no less. I mean, that, that's got to be a stain. Yeah, I think UCLA can do better. And again, I just believe that um, I think they've had, uh, uh, he had his best season last year. And nine and four could have been much better. Even I thought they were a really good football team last year, but um, yeah, they need a boost going into the big 10. Well, and after last night when I was watching Texas A&M and this uh, kerfuffle as to whether Mark Stoops is officially the Nets head coach, or if he's officially staying at Kentucky, I felt like we were going to see another version of 2017 Tennessee, whereas Every day there was something. Oh, they're going to get Mike Gundy. Oh, they're going to get Dave Durant. Oh, they're going to get Jeff Brom. Oh, we're going to get Mike Leach. And then Phil Former decides, oh, I'm going to fire the AD while this is happening. So the Mike Leach thing isn't happening. Oh, we're going to get a Saban assistant. This old part didn't. I, I was thinking we were going to see something like that with Texas A&M for a moment. Because, I mean, good grief. Yeah, if you're going to let, regardless of what people think of Jimbo Fisher, if you're going to let a competent football coach go that you at least know is, is capable of running the program, now succeeding is another thing, but running it capably, and you're going to let him go and you're going to eat $77 million, you better be extremely confident that, of course, Texas A&M can get a coach. It's a top 10 or 15 job in the country, but get you need to have a list and have strong confidence that you're going to get one of your two, three, five, whatever that number is of guys that you believe is an upgrade from Jimbo Fisher. Yeah. Well, and another thing I was thinking about, if Indiana was to hire Jason Candle, do they become the next Iowa State? And do you think Toledo is a cradle of coaches 2.0? Well, yeah, Jason Candle's done an excellent job at Toledo. Uh, He didn't do a great job initially. It took him some some time to turn things around and get that rolling there. But, um, yeah, they're the class, not just this season, they're the class of the MAC. And the MAC has been a uh, starting ground and a source of a lot of great power five coaches. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was rough when Matt Campbell first showed up at Iowa state. They, 
couldn't even get a winning record for the next two, three years. I mean, but now they are, and that's pretty big right there, especially in Ames, Iowa. So, I mean, if Indiana did get somebody like Candle, maybe they could get something like that. Not saying they will, but who knows? Anything can happen. And um, I'm going to get off here. Definitely going to be get myself prepared for a little after dark and telling chat to tell everybody to stay tuned for tonight's edition of college football after dark where some friends are definitely going over the takeaways of rivalry week and give a little preview of championship week. It's going to be great. Sounds good, Jackson. Appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me on. Stay safe, stay warm. It's cold out. Yes, championship week in college football, getting away from the coaching news for a second. Uh, this is a different scene than what we had at this time last year. Last year, we had the ACC championship game meant nothing toward the playoff. The Pac-12 championship game could have meant something had USC held serve and won. They, of course, got blasted in the second half with a hobbling Caleb Williams. So Utah won, and they were a three-loss team. So we had two conferences play themselves out, and again, the ACC was already out. And then, so we only had three conferences really in play. And of course, the USC-Utah game was on a Friday night, so we knew going into Saturday, we've only got three conferences in play. So the double-up, of teams coming out of one conference was very much in play last year. So Ohio state fans, I hate to break it to you, but even at 11 and one and what I consider to be a better team this year than last year, you know, life isn't always fair and life isn't always exactly what it's been in previous years. So we can compare seasons, compare teams, compare records and do that in all sorts of ways, but some seasons are just different than other seasons. Sometimes what worked and what got you to a certain destination one season isn't going to get you there another season. So it looks as though you're going to have to win a conference championship in the year of 2023. And maybe that's apropos because it is the final year that you have to win a conference championship or that we have the setup that leads us to that potential destination because going forward, Hey, third place, good enough. We're going to the playoffs, which is going to make for a great playoffs potentially going forward with the 12 team playoff. But the regular season is in some respects going to take a hit. And the expansion of these conferences doubling up at the same time and that coming about at the same time as the expansion of the playoff is creating these awkward situations. So if it would have been one or the other, if the big 10 would have exploded the big 12 and the sec and expanded with all these added teams and now the ACC with three additional teams, but we would have stayed with a four team playoff it would have maintained the integrity of these rivalries. Not that they're not still going to be great, but the rivalries as it pertains to playing for championships and the conference championship games, the integrity and the meaningfulness of those conference championship games would have stayed with a 14 playoff. Or if we would have gone to a 12 team playoff, but the conferences would have stayed at 10 and 12 and 14 teams, then that could have been worked out in such a way that would have maintained to a certain extent, the integrity of these rivalries and these late season games, final weekend games being super, super meaningful. They're going to be meaningful going forward. Just like they're meaningful in the NFL. They're meaningful. They mean something. They change seeding. They change who's in and who's out in some cases, but they're not all or nothing. Do or die. This is it. 
we're losing that for the top half of the 12-team playoff. Of course, there are going to be games in which it's do or die late in the season for other teams. There is actually going to be more meaningful games in college football, but there's not going to be the do or die at the top with the elites going forward. So again, expanding the conferences and expanding the playoffs at the same time is going to create, there's no way around it, is going to create awkward situations and games that based on name brand, based on their records in previous seasons would have been titanic. And in the future will be almost like what you see near the end of an NFL season. And I'm going to hate to see it on one hand, but I'm also going to, it's, it's going to be interesting. Ohio State and Michigan would have played in the last three Big Ten championships under the new format. They would have played as the one in two seeds in the Big Ten. I also wonder how they would have been seeded, not that it would have mattered, uh, but they would have had to show up with home and road uniforms. So there's some seeding process going forward, even though you would have Ohio State 11-0, 8-0 in the Big Ten, Michigan 11-0, 8-0 in the Big Ten. One of them is going to be the one seed and the other is going to be the two seed. I don't know how they're going to figure that out, but it's not, doesn't matter. Okay, it's laundry. But... The issue is not just that those two teams, and we can apply the same thing to Alabama, Georgia, if they're going to be truly as dominant as they've been. Now, LSU, Tennessee, Texas A&M, Oklahoma, Texas will have something to say about that. So it's less likely that we're going to see this kind of dominance out of one or two teams going forward. Washington, Oregon, USC, UCLA. But... If we did, it's one thing to have two teams play the last game of the season and then play a rematch in the, in this case, the Big Ten championship game. Okay, that's bad enough. But what makes it worse in the case of the last three Big Ten seasons is that neither one of these two teams would have needed to win that game to make it to the Big Ten Championship. So it's different if, let's say, Michigan's already secured a spot in the Big Ten Championship game, but Ohio State needs to win to make the Big Ten Championship game. Then it's all out for Ohio State. They got to win. They got to beat Michigan to then get to the Big Ten Championship game. Then Michigan has to decide, okay, do we want to take care of Ohio State this week? Or do we want to rest our starters and take care of them next week and take our chances? And you see that all the time in the NFL. But to have both teams secure a spot before the final game, then I don't know what that's going to look like going forward. And hopefully with the entrance of USC, UCLA, Oregon, and Washington, and hopefully better play out of the likes of Penn State, Wisconsin, and others, we won't get to see that. Or for those Ohio State and Michigan fans that enjoy just having a complete lockdown on this conference, then you'll enjoy having back-to-back -back games uh, on a fairly regular basis. All right, let's go to the lines here at the Voice of College Football. We got Coop here. Howdy. Long How are you doing? Long time uh, listener, first time caller. Well, thanks for calling. I appreciate it. I uh, just wanted to ask a few questions. Um, you know, I got IU in my profile picture. I went there, but I'm a long time Michigan fan. And I was just wondering what um, what team do you think Michigan will play in the playoffs, assuming they be Iowa, of course. So let me see. I'm, I'm thinking it's the Pac-12 champion. Yeah, well, I've not made any predictions, but let's say Georgia wins 
Florida State wins, and whoever wins in the Pac-12 is going to be in the playoff, and they're going to be probably the same seed. Uh, so if it's Michigan, Florida State, Georgia, and let's say Oregon, uh, the way things stand right now, Georgia's going to maintain the number one seed. Even if they they consider flip-flopping them after Michigan just beat Ohio State and Georgia only beat Georgia Tech, they're going to flip-flop them again the next week because Georgia is going to have a win against Alabama. So Georgia goes back to one, Michigan's two. Yeah, Florida State's going to be four. And like you say, uh, the Oregon-Washington winner is going to be three. So you think Michigan stays two no matter what, even if Bama wins? Bama wins. Well, if Bama support. wins, then Michigan's number one. And then Michigan would play Bama then, right? Then you've got a mess. We don't know who's going to be there. And if Texas wins, they might still be out. <laughs> well, but then Texas has the head-to-head to Bama. Absolutely. That's the big question. That's the big question that everyone has. Is the committee gun going to favor... They've got Texas in front of Alabama right now, but the Georgia win is going to look so much more impressive than the Oklahoma State win. So are they going to make that move, even though there was a head-to-head game? Yeah. Lots in the air. Um, there, There is precedent for that. They, they did that in 2016, although that was a little bit different because Ohio State had a better record than Penn State. What do you think the future of McCord is? Do you think he'll stay or do you think he'll kind of get pushed to transfer or just transfer on his own? Or do you, do you think they want to develop him more? I think that they should want to develop him. I don't see all the issues that everybody else sees. I, I think he's a good quarterback and I don't put that second interception on him. And I don't even know about the first interception depending on your perspective, only Ryan Day, McCord, and Marvin Harrison know what was supposed to happen on that play exactly. But the last one, uh, I haven't seen Tom Brady or Peyton Manning throw a perfect pass when somebody's hanging on their arm. So, and, and you're in desperation situation with 25 seconds and no timeouts. So anyway, no, I'm not selling him as, as a great quarterback, but I think he's a top 25 quarterback in the country right now. And he could be developed more. Uh, he's certainly been under fire, so he's going to have more. He's been He's been more proven under extreme circumstances than just about anybody out there. Uh, I don't know what Ryan Day truly thinks of him or the season that he had. Uh, I think he's improved a lot over the season. I've been watching him. Yeah, I think he did too. I think, I mean, JJ's first season, he was not the greatest, and then he kind of came on the stage this year a little more. I think Ohio would would benefit from keeping him. I know a lot of the fans are outraged with his performance, but I think he should stay. I do too. Uh, the fans are the fans and they expect perfection. And maybe we watch too much Sunday football and expect these guys to play that way. They're going to miss throws. They all do. JJ played a near flawless game, but he only threw 20 passes and he was never behind. He threw maybe two bad passes. I think he was 16 out of 20. And, uh, but, uh, McCord played well after the first quarter. Yeah, I thought so too. Well, that's anything really... else. Uh, no, sir. I'm watching uh Philadelphia. They're kicking the field goal right now. Okay. Oh, they just tied the game against Buffalo. All right, I'll let you go, Mark. I appreciate <laughs> you being here. Thanks. Yep. Peace out. We always appreciate the NFL updates. All right. Uh, Also, keep in mind that the Big Ten Live show is coming up at 6 p.m. Eastern time on Monday. 6 p.m. Eastern time on Monday. I can simply promise you a great show. 
even though I'm taking part in it. But uh, we expect to have a great show, the Big Ten Live show, and, of course, the focus, Iowa and the Michigan in the Big Ten Championship game. Michigan is a 21-and-a-half point favorite, which, hey, if that would have been two years ago, that would have been a much better score for the Hawkeyes than it turned out to be at 42-3, 39 points. We are going to break down all of the conference championship games this week. So be looking out for those preview videos. Everyone, I mean, every conference championship game, all 10 of them, but especially I love to do a statistical comparison of the two teams that are playing for conference championship games. Let's say Iowa versus Michigan against common opponents, Florida state, Louisville on and on. The only two teams that played in the regular season that are playing in a conference championship game would be, of course, Oregon and Washington. Washington won at home. That was a great game. Arguably, arguably the best college football game this season. And despite Washington winning, Oregon's been playing better recently, every week playing better. And of course, this is going to be neutral site. And there's also a theory out there. I hear it all the time. I don't know if we can necessarily back it up. We could go through past history to see if it could be verified that it's difficult to beat the same team twice. In the NFL, that goes to three times since they play in divisions that it's difficult to beat the same team three times in college twice. That would have to be verified to me. And actually, I don't remember what the numbers showed, but I went through the history of college football. Man, I wish I, I guess I could find that video. I don't know if I showed that during a live stream, then I could never find it. Or if I actually posted a separate video. We've posted like 15,000 videos on this channel. So I have no idea. Sometimes I run into people on social media. They let me know that, they've been on as a guest and I don't remember them not because they're not great people just because we've had too many people on here in 13 years and again we've done like 15,000 videos but I do remember specifically that I went through the history of college football and this is where I need to keep a big database because I'm going to have to do all that work over again Need to keep a big database of statistics. So, for example, on when was this from? This was from Friday. And, you know, I'm just taking notes after notes after notes after notes after notes on all these games. Just all day Friday. These are from Friday. Then this is noon on Saturday. Notes after notes after notes after notes and just, just. Yeah. And put all that in a database that I'll have it. But I could not, from what I remember, in reviewing rematches during the same season that I could come to a real conclusion. And actually, it's a valid statistic because normally it wouldn't be if it, they were just random games. But since in college football... See, in the NFL, the rematch could be between a team that's, I hate the 17th game schedule, so I'm not going to even make that an example. A team that went 12 and four versus a team that went four and 12 in the same division. Well, that rematch statistic is invalid because one team's so much better than the other team. But in college football, this would be one of the rare times that actually the, the results from the games are more valid in college football because all these teams rematches are in championship games. So they're very similar teams. First of all, they're playing in the same conference. So they're playing very light competition out of their eight or nine game schedule, five, six, seven games are exactly the same common opponents. And then they're playing in a conference championship game. And so they were the two best teams in the conference or in the case of Michigan and Iowa, maybe the first best team, the best team and the fourth best team. But 
you know what I mean? Almost all the time, they are the two best teams. And if they played in the regular season, or there have been on occasion games in which, for whatever reason, two teams were matched up in a bowl game that played in the regular season, that happened in the 1978 Orange Bowl, Nebraska, Oklahoma played again in the Orange Bowl after they played at the end of the regular season. You had a Michigan State USC rematch in the Rose Bowl in 1988 from the 87 season when they played in the regular season. And I believe Michigan State won both. They did win the Rose Bowl. And I believe USC and Michigan State did that again. Uh, But then there are obviously during this age of conference championship games, there have been all sorts of rematches. I can't think of too many in the Big Ten. Can't think of too many in the Big Ten. 2019, Ohio State beat Wisconsin in the regular season, 38-7. Then they beat them in the conference championship game. They were down 21-7 at half, came back and won 34-21. So that was a rematch, Ohio State-Wisconsin, 2019. Um, Big Ten, Big Ten. I believe Wisconsin and Nebraska, that was only the second Big Ten championship game. Leaders and legends, remember that? That they played, and I believe Nebraska won the regular season matchup. Then Wisconsin just put on a rushing clinic, 70-31. to But I'm almost positive those are the only two rematches in Big Ten championship games. The SECs had quite a few because we have an SEC championship game going all the way back to 1992. The ACC as well. There have been rematches in the ACC championship game. But also think about it with division formats, the just the fact that they played in the regular season makes it unlikely that there's going to be a rematch because one of the two teams automatically has a loss in the regular season. And usually teams that make conference championship games only have zero, one or two losses. Louisville's two losses. Florida State's got none. Georgia's got none. Alabama's got one out of conference. They're undefeated in the SEC. Michigan's undefeated. Iowa's got two losses. Same thing, Texas, Oklahoma State. One loss, three losses, only two of them in the Big 12. And then you got zero losses and one loss. Yes, Nebraska and Washington had a very strange rematch in the Holiday Bowl. Nebraska blasted Washington by like five touchdowns in the regular season. But then Washington was like a two-touchdown underdog and beat Nebraska in the Holiday Bowl. When was that? That was in the late. That was in the early 2000s. George is here. And let's get to some uh, super chats. We do appreciate those. G Calendar, thank you so much for the 10 spot there. Appreciate you. Thanks for being here. We also have Shule Sooner. That's our guy. Thank you, man. Appreciate you being here. Can't believe the regular season is over. I know it's crazy, isn't it? And I feel bad if you root for Illinois. I know Erica doesn't, but I do. If you root for Illinois, if you root for Virginia, Purdue, Indiana, Baylor, Stanford, I could keep going. Basically, if you're not going to a bowl game. Although I don't like what I hear about from most people these days in the last few years about going to bowl games and not caring about their team going to a bowl game. Man, I don't like that. But uh, Shule Sooner, of course, Oklahoma is going to have a nice little bowl destination. 
uh, after their 10 and two season, get a win, finish in the top 10. I don't know if people care about that anymore. I don't know if they care if their team finishes ranked or finishes in the top 10. I want my team for as much as I know this makes no sense. I'm being completely contradictory, but I'm human. I'm allowed I was going to throw something else in there for my personal life, but I won't. That, even though I rail on the AP poll and the coaches poll, and I don't believe in it, I think they screw up all the time. I think they screwed up this week. I looked at it. I didn't look at the whole poll. I looked at the, the top five or six. I do want my team to be ranked as high as possible because that's just, it's part of history. It goes in the archives and it will be looked up time and time again. It will be looked up. Okay. Did you finish number nine or did you finish number six? And people have a perception about that. Again, I shouldn't care because I've got little respect for the AP poll. Now that doesn't mean we have any AP writers out there that I may want to have on here. That doesn't mean I disrespect you in particular. You may do your due diligence and do a great job of ranking these teams. But as a composite, it's a horror show. It's horrible. Erica, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for the five spot there. Mark. Who do you think is Iowa's next offensive coordinator? Also, if you could pick anyone, who would it be? These are two different questions to most people's opinions. All right. This is what I've got for you. Uh, I will tell you, Erica, that to honor your super chat, I'm sure that Corey and I will be going through that, if not this Tuesday because of the championship game. But the next Tuesday and following Tuesdays until they hire an OC. Um, so I don't have a great answer for you. I haven't given it any thought. Who do I think will be? You know, I, I know that because of the culture at Iowa and because of the way Kirk Ferentz runs a program that I think having a relationship with the candidate is more meaningful to him than it is to other coaches and having a fit that goes beyond X's and O's that goes beyond who is going to produce the most points, who is going to produce the most yardage, who is going to help develop our players into great offensive players at their positions and truly coordinate a great offense that is important, <laughs> or I guess with Kirk, it's important to be able to continue to mold an Iowa-looking offense. But I think the football is, of course, the job, but he wants somebody that he can work with. I think that's extremely important to him. He wants to know who he's hiring as a person and as a, a coaching style and approach. Who's going to be working with his team that he can trust, that he respects, that he believes in? More so than just, wow, he's got the best offensive mind in the game. I'm getting him. Completely different than what I imagine. I can't back this up than what I would imagine somebody like Lane Kiffin would go for. I've never met the guy. Don't care. I'll meet him. We'll get to know each other. Oh, he's the best. I talked to him. He diagram plays. We talked offensive football for seven hours. He's amazing. We're right in tune when it comes to offensive football. Get him. But I'm sorry I don't have a list for you. In terms of who I would hire, if I could pick anyone I would like to have an answer for you. Let me simmer on that while I take some other calls and I'll see if I can find a name that would be a good fit for Iowa. 
but also challenge Kirk and shake him up a little bit to be better. All right. We got Golden Playbook here. Golden Playbook, what's going on? How's it going? It's going pretty well. How are you? Doing good. Um, so I got a, a question for you. Sure. Um, so is Ohio State out of the playoff or are they still in? Well, it's a subjective selection, so we don't know, but most likely they're out. Uh, uh, it's yeah, going to be was... awfully difficult for them to get in. They need a number of teams to lose. Right. Um. Yeah, it was a pretty uh, good game, you know, overall. I felt like Ohio State was pretty – both teams were evenly matched, but – um, I just wanted to ask you if they're eliminated or not, because I know you said that Michigan, if they would have lost to. Yeah, so let me eliminated. answer your question a little more specifically. If Michigan wins a Big Ten championship, let's say if Georgia wins the SEC championship game uh, and the winner of the Pac-12 is going to be in the playoffs. So there you've got three spots taken Ohio state needs Texas to lose and Florida state to lose to be selected to the playoffs. Did I get that right? Yes. They need those two to lose. Oh, okay. So that's so if like, if Florida state loses to Louisville and Texas loses to Oklahoma state, they need right. both of those outcomes under the scenario. I just drew up. They actually, Ohio State fans, believe it or not, you need Michigan to win. Right. Uh, not that I generally think Iowa's going to get a crack at the playoffs, but it would just make it a lot less messy. Just have Michigan just win and be in the playoffs. Just have Georgia just knock out Alabama and win. Uh, to make it a little bit cleaner, have Washington beat Oregon to give them a second loss and just have Washington be undefeated and just get two losses out of Texas and Florida State. And Ohio State will be in the playoff just like they were last year. Right. Yeah. I just wanted to ask. Um, but, man, it's kind of unfortunate. You know, football season is uh, coming to an end, you know. Went by fast, but uh, did you watch any of the? Did you watch any of the um, LSU and Texas A and M game? Uh, that was on at noon at the same time as Ohio State Michigan. I had a screen on with that game, but I can't say I paid any attention to it. Very little attention to it, just during commercials. Mm. Uh, what about that Bama game, man? Yeah, yeah I saw the fourth quarter. <clears throat> wow, that was a miracle right there. Yeah, it probably shouldn't have been, but it was. Yeah. Um, overall, you know, I'm really happy that uh, we got, you know, our win against uh, Stanford, even though they're not that great. Um, glad that we're 9-3. and three. Not a terrible season. Not at I think all. we did. As long as we get into a bowl game and win, and that's uh, 10 wins right there. So that's not bad, I don't think. Um, but, yeah, I've been wanting – honestly, I don't have a problem with uh, Sam Hartman as a QB. I just, I just don't think he's great against uh, good opponents is all, like. I've been advocating for, you know, Angeli to get a shot for a while, but. Did he play against Stanford? Yeah, he got a few snaps. Yeah. If I would have been coaching, he would have gotten a ton of snaps. Yeah. And I don't really understand. They didn't really let him throw the ball as much either. Like, so it's kind of weird. Um, but yeah, Honestly, they get jelly. Obviously, he's going to have to work for it, but I think that he should get a shot, honestly. And I personally don't think we should go in the portal for a quarterback, another QB, 
because I'd rather them, you know, develop their own. You know? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of coaches approach with this transfer portal when it comes to quarterbacks is to make it through spring practice and truly evaluate what they have. And if they're not pleased with what they have, then to go out and get a quarterback after spring practice. All right. Yeah. I just don't like, maybe we need some wide receivers, you know, but I just don't think a QB, like, I just feel like we need to develop our own. You know, we got young guys on the roster right now and that needs to get some reps, you know. That's just personally my opinion, but. Yeah, you're right. Uh, the best way to approach it is not to go get a free agent quarterback every off season who's going to be around for one season. Right. But other than that, you know, great. Uh, it's kind of sad that football season's already over. Just can't wait to uh, watch some of the conference championship games of this weekend. Um, but yeah, sorry for the uh, loss. Uh, I know you're an Ohio State fan, sorry. Um, it was a good game to watch, but. Yeah, it was a good game. All right, yeah. man. Anything else? Uh, nope. That'd be I it. appreciate you being here. All right, thank you. Have a good night. Yeah, this Notre Dame game against Stanford, they were up 56-16. to 16. They won 56-23. Sam Hartman threw 14 passes. So I understand he's a senior. He's the last guy there. He wants to play, finish out his career. I don't know if he's going to play in the bowl game or not. He's going to prepare for the NFL. So Steve Angeli, their up-and-coming quarterback, threw one pass in a game that they won by 40 points. I don't understand that. Play him. Play him the entire second half. All right. Our buddy Joey's dropping by. Hi, Mark. How you doing tonight, buddy? I'm good. How you doing? Good. I'm doing good. I, I had to come in. You know, Dana Holgerson getting fired and everything, and, and I've been a strong proponent of they needed to fire him a long time ago. They should have never hired him. But, uh, you know, now there's an offensive coordinator. He wouldn't fit in at Iowa. But, you know, he's a great offensive coordinator, but I could see him getting picked up somewhere as an offensive coordinator in the power five level. But also sure. I look at coaches that, that could be hired from like Tulane and Dana Holgerson being the head coach of Tulane. I could see something like that happening too. But uh, one name came to mind a while ago when you were talking about Iowa offensive coordinator. Uh, I don't know if they could get him or not, but uh, Andy Lud Ludwig uh, at Utah. So that would be that would be a good offensive coordinator for Iowa. But I don't know if they could get him from Utah. That's a good day. Right I think a lot and, of yeah, uh, there, there would be a similar, yeah, approach in philosophy there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that would be the best bet uh, if I ever could get him. You know, there's a, there's a few of them, but I, <laughs> I I think it's funny that if we look, I, there's a there's a uh, a coach that's available uh, right now, thanks to today, and that's Jeff uh, Grimes. Or Grimms, is it Grimes from Grimes. Baylor? They brought yeah. him today. So hey, they could they could go after him, but that would he's got a pretty good uh uh different type of philosophy than what fit in at Baylor, but he might fit in at Iowa. So um I think I think that would be another good name for Iowa. The Pitt offensive coordinator Frank Signetti was fired today as well. Yeah, there's there and I can't believe they fired him, but yeah, okay. So there's a good one too. That's a good name. Um, Frank Sinetti is uh it's gonna be a great uh you know, I think he's a he's a really good offensive uh of mind. You know, he's done really good work over the years and got pit to the ACC championship game, right? So so yeah, that would be a good one. I, I look I look around the country, there's not too many that would fit in at an Iowa program, you know, and so that's where that's where it makes it tough. Uh, one coach that is an offensive coordinator for the first time this year, but just this coaching style from what I've seen would fit in good at Iowa. And that's uh, Chad Scott at West Virginia. 
and this is his first stint as offensive coordinator this year at West Virginia. He, he's a running back coach, you know. That's what he is, is a running back coach and a fantastic running back coach. Done a pretty good job with West Virginia's offense this year, you know. So uh, he came from Clemson, right? Chance, right? Chance uh, no, no, no he I was, I think, where did he, he come from? Actually, yeah, I think he was at Troy with uh, with Neil Brown. He came over okay. from Troy with Neil Brown, I believe, and was our running back coach. And this year got promoted to offensive coordinator and, and it's done a pretty nice job, you know, in West Virginia having, having an eight and four record. Um, after everybody said we'd finished last in the Big 12. So that, that was pretty good. But, you know, I don't see them. But but uh, somebody said in the chat that uh, Iowa has reached out to him. I don't know who they were talking about, but probably the uh, Utah coach, Andy. So Andy Andy fits into Iowa perfect. I just don't know if they could steal him from Utah. That would be my, my guess there. But uh, anyway, what do you think about the – a little early, I guess, to talk about some bowl games, but you know, West Virginia going to a, a bowl game, and I, I'm looking. I, I was looking at some projections of where they could go, and and there's some interesting uh, matchups there. So they've got us uh, possibly facing Maryland in the Liberty Bowl, or Illinois okay. in the uh, in the um, uh, Guaranteed Rate Bowl. Uh, Illinois, uh, West- unless they need more spots to be filled illinois did not qualify for a bowl again unless they need five yeah. and seven teams yeah and, and i don't understand um these bowl tie-ins anymore they're, they're like all over the place because they got us playing anybody from clemson now the acc to auburn now the uh, sec to <laughs> illinois out the pt and you know they at one time they had us facing usc out, out of the pac 12 it, it's crazy these bowl tie-ins anymore. It used to be you kind of knew you was going to face an ACC team or an SEC team in this bowl, with, but uh, it's not like that anymore, which is is pretty cool. I like the fact that you could play basically anybody. But um, anyway, I will let you get to some other callers. I just wanted to come in because I heard you say about the Iowa coach and, and things and who you thought, and I just think Andy would fit in uh, real well there. So I hear you. I think that's a good one. That would be- that would be my pick. All right, Mark. Right, um, everybody have. Oh, let me let me let me say this um, to the to the Michigan fans. You were right. I was wrong. Uh, okay, but at the beginning of the year, when I said Penn State would probably co- would be competing for the, the Big Ten championship, and they would beat Michigan and Ohio State. Um, you know, they didn't beat either team, but uh, in all fairness, I didn't know at the beginning of the year that Michigan was going to cheat. So. I just want to point that out. Yeah, we didn't know that then. <laughs> yeah, no, they we didn't know that then. Know. I think uh, uh, Penn State uh, had had a great team this year. You know, obviously they were a really good team. Um, but uh, congrats to Michigan. Uh, my only fear of all this uh, Michigan hype and Michigan getting in the playoffs and then Michigan maybe going on and winning national championship. What if the NCAA comes back and makes a vacate some victories, throws everything? It throws 2023 into a dungeon uh, as a season. So that's yeah, what that's, I don't like uh, about this. Yeah, I don't either. I was telling somebody else that the same uh, today. was telling somebody that, that, uh, yeah, we could be in that situation a year from now. Vacated wins, and we watched it, but so yeah. <laughs> it happened. And the thing about but, it. Is- I just think Michigan was Michigan's such a good team. I don't think they needed to do that. They, they didn't need to steal signs and stuff from from teams. And I just can't. I, I in all in all fairness, I can't see Jim Harbaugh wanting that. So I don't, you know. But you have to say he had to know. He's the CEO of that program. And what good what good is sign stealing if you're not going to let the head coach know that you've got their seat? So. Anyway, all right, Mark, I'll let you get to some other callers. Yeah, we've got a good 25 hours probably under our belt talking about all of that. So my opinions are out there. (laughs) Thanks, Joey. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah, I'm going to stay away from that. I get asked 
about that all the time, and we will talk about it in the future. We've talked about it certainly for the last month ad nauseum. So we will leave it at that. Uh, just to clarify, Frank Signetti, and I didn't know his exact stops in the NFL, but I knew that they were extensive. Now I'm looking at them. Rams, Giants, Packers. Uh, I knew he was an NFL guy. Now, in terms of recently coming back to college football, Boston College in 2020 and 2021, of course, working with Phil Dracovic, and then went to Pitt in 22 and 23. So he missed the ACC championship team there at Pitt, but they were nine and four last year. Didn't fare too well this year, and he got canned. All right, back to the phone lines. We've got the real MVP here. Hey, Mark, how you doing this evening? I am doing just fine. I'm guessing that you're doing better than you were about this time last night. Relieved, Mark, relieved. That's all I've got to say. Uh, now, for Texas A&M perspective, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, okay? So you don't want Mark Stoops, okay? You think he's not good enough for the Texas A&M job. So you go out there and you get Mike Elko. It, it, all he is to me is a less proven version of Mark Stoops currently. True, but he's already worked there, so they know something about him a little bit more intimately, for lack of a better word. Uh, and do we know that Texas A&M put an end to that negotiation? Well, it's been reported on all sides that everybody, you know, depending on what report you look at, tells you who ends it differently. I have no idea who ended. Some people think it was Texas A&M boards of regents. Some people think boosters paid Mark Stoops not to take the jobs. Some people think Mark Stoops declined the job. So I have no idea who declined who, but it just doesn't make sense for me for any angle for this deal not to come together if both sides were interested looking okay. at the alternative. Yeah. Well, if you believe in dead spin, they're saying Texas A&M stoops to new low by unhiring Mark Stoops amid fan revolt. Yeah, I don't think fans should be the ones to dictate who gets a job and who doesn't get a job, Mark. That's just me. Uh, no, based on my experience here, uh, I certainly would not be relying on fans to give me direction on hiring and firing or anything else. Right. And also, if fans were to dictate that hire, how come those same fans aren't accept that they got Mike Elko? I don't see the greatness that Mike Elko has put in to just completely outclass Mark Stoops. Yeah, exactly. I would think that the same fans that would be uh that that would be rejecting Mark Stoops need to see Urban Meyer or somebody of that. Not that there's too many on that level, but maybe a couple of levels down, but somebody with a name that they would, that that's what they're looking for. They're looking for a big splash. They're looking for a splash hire, a name. So I don't know. Mike Elko has less of a name in college football than Mark Stoops does. Right, right. And if you're Mark Stoops, I don't get why, if he was the one to back out of the deal, I don't understand what last-minute changes would have been made in order to back out the deal. Sometimes people just have a change of heart. Well, why? Why? I, I don't understand it. I mean, this is something I feel like you would put a lot of time, effort, and thought into, and I don't understand making this big of a consequential decision that's involving this amount of money, you would have a change of heart during the last hours of the process. Well, let's understand that for as important as these decisions are, with a lot riding on them, reputation and brand and money, that they're not made with a lot of time. They're made pretty quickly, usually. So it's not like uh, other situations in life that, that have a longer time to allow the situation to breathe and meet with your family and think about it and think it through and pray about it. If that's in your, uh, 
in your uh, belief system. But this is usually like you get contacted. We need 48 hours and we need you to tell us. And we're going to talk to you about the job a few times and you got to make a decision. I got you. I got you. I'm just, it's just surprising to me that it's Elko after Stoops. I thought they would have gotten some a massive name like Meyer or Sweeney or something like that. Just going, to me, this is a lateral to downgrade. Well, based on what they've accomplished so far, both Stoops and Jimbo are a massive upgrade from Elko, but they're not looking to the past. Uh, they're they're not looking to make the same mistake that Major League Baseball teams make with long-term contracts, paying for a past. They're paying for a future. So they are banking on Mike Elko being an up-and-coming great coach. I guess, I guess, but isn't he pretty old, Mark? Like, isn't he in his late 60s? Late 60s? Mike Elko? I Is he really? No, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not good with age. Okay, I, I'll Mark freely Stoops, admit that. Stoops, I know Mark Stoops is 56, so I don't. Yeah, I'm looking at that right now. Let's see. Mike Elko is, no, I don't think he's anywhere close to his late 60s. He's 46. Okay, well, you can tell how bad I am when it comes to age then, Mark. He just looks a lot older to me than that. But Now, Mike Elko is the first name that came out of my mouth. Well, even way before Jimbo Fisher was fired, when people would ask me who I thought Texas A&M would go after, you know, putting aside the big name, big splash guys, just in terms of really good football coach who's on the rise. Mike Oka was the first guy I thought of. Well, I get that now, but now we got the side of knowing the two major options is between Elko and Stoops. And I, I kind of feel insulted in a way, Mark, to be honest with you, that we weren't good enough for this Texas A&M job, but no, 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 our no. main rival no, you in can't basketball, go. Duke, you, you, was you good enough. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. Be happy and just feel good and go forward with your guy, Stoops. And, and, and if we never get to the bottom of the details of what happened, just believe that Mark Stoops came to the decision in his heart. It is so much better to be here in Kentucky than to go down to Texas and deal with that mess. That's why he made the decision. The decision was made by him to stay at Kentucky. I, I like that narrative, Mark. I also like the narrative that Kentucky has more to look forward to in their future than Texas A&M. And Mark Stoops knew that ahead of time because, unfortunately, now Texas A&M's got Big Brother in their backyard that's going to beat the living soul out of them probably on a yearly basis. They're going to lose to Bama, Georgia, Texas, Oklahoma, you know, all these great teams, and they think they're one of them. Where Kentucky, we know our role. We just want to be 7-5, and 8-4, or four, make a decent bowl game. And Stoops knows it. I think Mark Stoops has got personally got for bang for his buck the best job in college football, Mark. I really do. All he has to do is go seven and five every year, and he's a top 10 paid head coach. I don't think there's any other job in the country that would do that. What do you think about that? You don't think at some point that Kentucky would say, let's say he racks up four straight seven and five seasons, that they wouldn't start to kind of push him along. Like we're paying for more than this. We need more than this. Now this, this should be a down year now at Kentucky. This should be a down year, seven and five. This was a down year this year. It was after the South Carolina loss. I felt like from a lot of people, but then we, you know, Kentucky beat Louisville and man, this was a pretty successful year. Mark beating Louisville, being a top 10 team. I get it. That's what we want. We don't, we, I mean, for Kentucky football, just being up there, hitting an upset, making a bowl game, that's our goal. It's not a, you know, pretty goal. We don't want to improve to a, well, I mean, obviously if we could, we would do it, but I think we are very realistic fans and I think we know we've kind of hit a hard ceiling, Mark, unfortunately. I honestly, as crazy as it is, I've thought about it if 
you know, we didn't have the world of TV money and all this fun stuff. I'd like to see Kentucky go to the Big 12 because I think we can win that conference every year. But unfortunately, we're in the SEC. Yeah, well, if it was only a football school and didn't play any other sports, maybe they would consider that and say, okay, is it worth making $30 million less per season in TV revenue, but winning a conference and being a, a big fish in a smaller pond? And they may opt to do that. But there are, for as important as football is everywhere, of course, it's second at Kentucky, number one. Number two, there are other sports to be considered to a small extent. And I'm sure Kentucky looks at its SEC standing as, as a badge of honor. And also, Kentucky just belongs geographically in the SEC. And it's just, you know, Kentucky's been in the SEC for how long? Long time, Mark. A yes, long time. A long, long time. Since like the 30s. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a very long time. And it's it just it's just kind of sad because for me, this would felt like kind of the final year Kentucky could ever do anything great. That's why I was so invested in this year. I, I just think we're an eight and four, seven and five team for now until infinity for the most part. I mean, I'm sure they'll have one season where they go nine and three, maybe ten and two, maybe at their absolute best, but it's over, Mark. I mean, it's just over for us. There's the 12 team playoff. That doesn't matter. Well, we're not going to make it. Never? Ever. I can confidently say Kentucky will not make the 12 team playoff for as long as it exists, as long as they're in the SEC. Well, I tend to agree with you, but I'm trying to give you some hope, and it's actually reasonable hope. You're not, you're not Indiana. You're not Rutgers. You are Kentucky, and you've been much better than that. And you've been on the fringe of what would have produced a playoff spot in the past as a 12-team playoff. Correct? You know, your 2018 team, your team two years ago, they would have been on the fringe of a playoff spot. I mean, what it, uh, we were like 16 or something Why not like that. About that. Why not have some hope that if Mark Stoops can elevate a little bit more, maybe you can go to a playoff once every five to 10 years. No, I, I just don't see that happen. I think Michigan versus the world's got a pretty good uh, Kentucky is exactly right. Rutgers. I think that's actually a pretty good comparison. We know our role. We're there to get B. I, and let's be honest, Mark, Kentucky makes the playoffs and then we get a lose by 50 lose by 60. I mean, what fun is there in that? You're not losing by 50 or 60. You're an SEC team. Did you did you see Kentucky play Georgia this year? Did you see them play Bama this year? Did you, did you see the 2018 Kentucky Georgia game? Uh I believe I remember that. Yeah, but I was about to remind you that this was not your playoff team this year. This is not the best of Kentucky football. And by the way, Kentucky did join the SEC. I did nail this in terms of a decade, 1932. So keep that locked and loaded for the next time you need that bit of information. Yeah, I'm sure that will come up on a daily occurrence, Mark. I looked it up. The final score of the Kentucky-Georgia game in 2018 was... Let me, let me guess. Let me guess. Where'd they play that game? Kentucky. They played at Kentucky and... So that was probably an October game and Kentucky had a really good record and there was a little bit of hype around that game. I think I remember that. Wasn't it like 40 to 13? 34, 17. Oh, 34, 17. Okay. I, I do kind of remember that game. Yeah, it was the most anticipated game in Kentucky football. And I mean, just... Instantly, at the first quarter, Georgia was bigger, faster, stronger than Kentucky. I mean, they just recruit at an elite level. They just got better players. Yeah, I'm not and, putting you up against Georgia. I'm putting you up against making a 12-team playoff. Well, if Kentucky wants to make a 12-team playoff, don't you think they're going to have to beat a Georgia, Alabama, Texas, Oklahoma, or a Tennessee, yeah. Florida? 
Oh yeah. Yeah. They can't yeah, lose all those teams. Right. And what evidence do we have that Kentucky can beat any of those teams? They can lose to two of them and maybe three if their schedule is tough enough. But of course they never schedule out of conference games. So they're going to have to go 10 and two. Right. And I, I just, I just don't see that happening more. All I mean, right. that's I tried. Yeah. I'm, I know I, I I'm hopeful that bowl games do what I, I think I was one of the first people suggested just do it based on a uh, storylines like this year, for example, Oregon state, Clemson, uh, Notre Dame, LSU, Oklahoma, USC, have those type of bowl games. That'd be fun. Uh, yeah. Have, I brought that up to somebody the other night, not my idea, your idea. And I've seen it somewhere else, but anyway, yeah, I did bring that up to somebody else. And I said, this format, this system is dying. Uh, the games are losing interest and players are opting out. And that's not necessarily going to stop that. But yes, storylines have the bowl. The, the committees of these bowl games work together for the common good, or they're probably not going to do that because they're into self-preservation and doing what's best for their own bowl game. But you put a committee over the entire deal and you make sure it's fair. You make sure that, okay, well, this is the Gator Bowl and they typically get a fifth place team in the SEC and a fifth place team from the ACC or the Big Ten. I don't know what the affiliation is now. Uh, and you go from there and you put a committee in charge of this. And yes, we want to see Brian Kelly coach against Notre Dame. We want to see Lincoln Riley coach against Oklahoma. What was the other one you had? Oregon State versus Clemson. Yeah, there you go, DJ. Yes. Uh, yeah. Do we have any other really good? For me, I would love to see up. us play NC State. Devin NC Leary State. connection. NC yeah. State's nine and three. I yeah. think it'd be a pretty even matchup on the field. Yeah. Yeah, an ACC nine and three team against an SEC seven and five team. That sounds like a even matchup to me. Right. We so just, I, I, we I really hope that. that way. But uh, from the projections, it looks like we're going to play Duke in the Duke's Mayo boat. Which, yay! I mean, who cares, Mark? Who? Duke. Duke. Okay. Well, it's a it's a basketball flavor that's going to be mentioned about. 837 times that they're both basketball blue bloods. I know. I know. And they're also going to mention the shot by, you know, that guy in that tournament game, <laughs> you know, you know, we, we all still hate him around here. There's actually people I see <laughs> randomly that has t-shirts that says we hate him. So there is a great 30 for 30 about Christian Leitner and about people hating him. It's really, yeah, it was, good. it was, it was. But anyway, Mark, uh, that's all I got for you this evening. Fight on to the Syracuse Orange. All right. Who are also looking for a head coach. I could have added them to my list. The list that includes Houston firing Dana Hogerson. So you Houston Cougar fans, let us know who you want the next head coach to be. It could be Jeff Trailer of UTSA. It could be Willie Fritz of Tulane. Could be others. And again, we posted a video tonight with Steve Helwick from SB Nation who had, in addition to those two, some really good, thoughtful candidates that have Houston ties or Texas high school or college football ties. IU finally gets rid of Tom Allen, Louisiana Monroe out with Terry Bowden, and UTEP firing Dana Dimmel after six seasons. And again, Texas A&M hires Mike Elko. That's what's being reported. It has not become official in Florida State with Jeff Lebby. All right, let's keep it rolling. We've got the defiant one on the line. Hey, Mark, how's it going? I am doing great. How are you? I am doing pretty good. You know, I heard the news earlier that Indiana finally fired Tom Allen. I am super excited. I am super happy. I think this was the year to fire Tom Allen if you needed to fire the man. Yeah, he had the two nice seasons, but since then it's been a train wreck and it's not turning around. And he's had three full seasons to do something and it's just not getting any better. Oh, no, definitely. And again, next season you get the four Pac-12 schools, which, you know, Washington, number four in the country, Oregon, number five in the country, 
use USC, UCLA, all the history they have. Indiana's not going to be better with Tom Allen next year. And you're playing those four schools plus other 14 schools in the Big Ten. Like, he will be fired anyways probably next year, but I think firing him this year was the right move, you know, to go with. Well, of course, they're not going to play all those teams. No, no, they're not. But, like, eventually they would. And, you know, yeah, yeah. They'll play about two per year. Yeah. Yeah. And we would probably get destroyed with Tom Allen as their head coach because our offense, besides a couple games this season, cannot really produce anything on the field. Yeah, we had a caller last night asking me if Tom Allen was going to get fired. And I said, well, first of all, I hope he does. Not That's not a slight on him personally. It's not personal. Uh, but he should get fired. He's not doing the job. And then also, I know it's little old Indiana, but little old Indiana plays in the Big Ten and has a television contract currently that is the best in college football and that is going to increase significantly next year. So there's no excuse not to play to pay top dollar for a head coach at Indiana and get an excellent coaching staff. Oh, no, I, I definitely agree with that, Mark. I definitely think now with all the candidates right now, who they think could be the head coach. I know uh, Candle, Jason Candle from Toledo is number sure. one. Uh, Chris Crane from Eastern Michigan is up there too. So yeah, these these head coaches they they have on their uh, list. They're decent head coaches. I think they'll bring in their staff and get their offense and defense, you know, schemes going. I think if they you know play it right, they recruit really well because you know with Purdue being down, you can probably out recruit Purdue now. You're not going to out recruit Notre Dame, but you can out recruit Purdue. He's like, hey. We're probably the second best team, you know, coming to our school. We can be the second best team in Indiana. And again, we play in the Big Ten. So, you know, you're going to play Washington. You're going to play UCLA. And if you get these guys from, you know, Washington, Oregon, California, say, hey, we go out west and we play these schools. You can possibly, that could be the pulling factor for getting recruits to Indiana. By the way, Indiana faces UCLA at the Rose Bowl next year and Washington. Those are the two Pac 12 games. And we'll probably get destroyed by probably Washington. UCLA might be a little closer game. I know Chip Kelly's on the chopping block over there. Nothing else I really say about that. Probably get destroyed by both of them. Yeah, I think Chip Kelly is going to be gone, I believe. Was he was 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 is is there a reason to really fire him though at UCLA? Uh, the reason to fire him is that he's been there now for, I believe, seven years and not accomplished anything. Yeah, but, you know, he took over for Jim Mora and all that, what happened there. And he didn't have really his offense and defensive schemes put in place yet. Seven years ago. True. That is very true. Seven years ago. That's an eternity <laughs> uh, in college football. He was given a lot of time. His first three to four seasons were an utter disaster. Mm -hmm. Like they lost all their non-conference games. They were deplorable. They had a three and nine season. They had a four and eight season. And then they, I thought that they were a really good football team last year with DTR at quarterback. They went nine and four. They came within, they came within about 15 yards of going to the PAC 12 championship game. They were about 15 yards away from field goal range to beat USC and go to the Pac-12 championship game. Uh, they blew a big lead in the bowl game, or you know they could have won like 11 games last year. I thought they were really good. And this year, they had a really good defense, which gives me some, some moment to pause here that maybe Chip Kelly can hire a defensive coordinator, but their offense was terrible, and that's his deal. Mm -hmm. That's his specialty. Oh, and I, I, they had an eight and four season uh, the year before last that was paper thin and smoke and mirrors as well. Oh, no, I definitely agree. He should be a fire, but I was wanting to bring that point up. I know he did take over, you know, that whole mess of a program at UCLA. I know it's probably his first two years. Was so it really a like, mess? Well, what was Mora? After what all did, that happened. Mora did better than Chip Kelly. True. Well, they kind of slowly started, you know, to fall off a little bit. Yeah, slowly fell off. And Jim Mora, I remember when Jim Mora, 
I'm sorry. I remember when Chip Kelly took the job from Jim Mora. I looked at Jim Mora's recruiting classes, and this is before the transfer portal exploded. So all those players were still on the roster, 90 some percent of them from Jim Mora's four recruiting classes that comprise the roster. And do you know that his composite recruiting rankings were better than Chip Kelly's during his heyday at Oregon? Mm, interesting. He had like a 13th rated composite recruiting class on that roster. Mm -hmm. You know, they went, yeah, it was coming off a four and eight season. And then they went six and six. He got fired. But before that, he went nine and five, 10 and three, 10 and three, eight and five. Finished in the top 15 in the country twice. Yeah. Didn't he go six and seven one year too? Like his first or second year there? Or six and eight, I should say. Yeah, it wasn't uh, six and eight was the year that uh, that must have been right before he was there because, yeah, they went six and eight one year and they had to play in a bowl game. So they got a exemption because they played in the Pac-12 championship game and lost to go to six and seven. But no, that was not uh, Mora. No, that was uh, New Heisel. Yeah, yeah New Rick New Heisel. I'm looking yeah. at his records right now, but he finished in the top 15 twice, mm -hmm. and he's 46 and 30 at UCLA. Chip Kelly, he was barely 500. Let's see what he is. He's he's 34 and 34. Mm -hmm, yeah. So I can see it. I can I can definitely see you know the reasoning behind it. You know, UCLA, you know, going to Big Ten next year. They want a winner. They want, you know, win a lot of games, be over 500, make bowl games, win conference championships, even maybe make a national championship. But, like, yeah, I think Chip Kelly was a good hire at first. I, I, I think Chip Kelly was probably the right guy at that time um, because he, what he did at Oregon. But, like, yeah, Oregon's different than UCLA from, like, a winning standpoint and from a winning tradition. But should they really be any different? No, they shouldn't. But looking at them historically, if you want to take them looking at it historically, take away the last five or ten years of what he did, what Oregon has been. Yeah, it depends what your history perspective is. If it's the last 10 or 15 years, then Oregon's a much better football program yeah. than UCLA. But if it's the entirety of college football history, then UCLA is a better program than Oregon. Yeah, I'm. They're both, I would say, the premier, one of the most, and like in the history of the West Coast college football, they were up there. Both of them were up there. And it's USC and it's Washington too, but both of them were up there for what they, what those both those programs have accomplished throughout their history. As Tim is letting us know, UCLA has a national championship. I know that they have won for sure. I think that they can also claim another one once mm -hmm. in the 50s and once in the 60s. And Oregon's just been, you know, there. Yeah. Well, I, I think national championships are overrated for one thing because there's so many fallacies in national championships, but they are meaningful, of course. Yeah. And people remember them. I'm not saying that they have no worth or no meaning. No. Of course they do, but they're, it's a faulty statistic. And Oregon is certainly, they've got to be the greatest program without a national championship. And they have played for two in the last 12 years. I don't definitely, yeah. And again, you know, 50s to 60s, you know, before there was a playoff, you know, national championship game, you know, those riders and all the polls and everything, you know, would fell for a national champion. I can definitely see your point there with like UCLA and the policies with, you know, picking a national champion and picking UCLA be a national champion. But, like, hey, again, it's Oregon. I say they're one of the most, again, in the last five, ten years, they're probably up there for top top 25 of programs, even with, you know, the couple of losing seasons they had in between in the last decade. In the top 25 in what time frame? In the last decade. In the last decade. Oregon? Oregon. I think they're pushing the top 10 in the last decade? 
Yeah, okay. We can say last. Yeah. I'd say in the last 15 years that Oregon's easily in the top 10. Oh, do last 15 years. Yeah, I'll say Oregon's top 10. Yeah, if you back it up to the Chip Kelly era and yeah. actually post Pete Carroll, I don't think there's any debate that Oregon's had the best program in the Pac-12. No, I, I definitely agree with that. You know, Washington's had its spurt. USC's had its spurt. Utah's had its spurt. Stanford's had its spurt. But overall, it's Oregon. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely agree with that, Mark. I definitely agree with that. And lastly, before I go, uh, Jed Fish has done, you know, an amazing job at Arizona. You know, 9-3 and three this year, just blew out Arizona State yesterday. Do you see him five or ten years from now at a bigger job? Or do you see him maybe staying at Arizona for a little longer? Well, when I'm asked these questions, I can never count on – that individual's preferences in life, how much oh, no. they care about their family and keeping them in one place and enjoy the culture, enjoy the working relationship with the administration, the quality of life, all of that. So I have no idea about that. This is like a pure football standpoint. Sure, exactly. Not five or 10 years. I think Jed Fish can have a major job in two years. Maybe this year. <laughs> like now. Well, I'm thinking, I'm thinking Arizona will want to pay him a little more to stick around for the Big 12 move next year. Oh, yeah. They are going to extend him. You know, we see ridiculous offers given to coaches for extensions. Like Tom Allen. There you go. He gets fired. How much money is Indiana wasted by extending? To, where was Tom Allen going? And he has two decent seasons at Indiana. For Indiana, they're really good seasons, but they're they're decent seasons. And they extend him seven years. And so now they're caught in a place where they're paying him 15 or 16 million dollars. It should have been 20, and they should have been basically within a year of being out of his contract. So whoever they have to uh, answer to that. That's just like Jimbo Fisher. Jimbo Fisher gets the biggest contract in college football, wins eight and nine games, does nothing special. And before the 21 season, or maybe it was after, yeah, it was, it was after the 2020 season when they won the orange bowl, big deal. They won the orange bowl, went nine and one against a bad schedule. They give him a 10. He's already got a 10 year contract. He's already in the midst just at the outset of a 10 year contract, they extend him another 10 years. And therefore they ended up having to pay him $77 million. And that figure should have been more like 35, 36 mm -hmm. million. I don't know if Jimbo Fisher is going eight and five, nine and four after four seasons for me. And I'm a Texas A&M and he wants a contract extension. I tell him, hell no. Uh, we've given you a great contract. Uh, and if he wants to flirt with LSU, bye. Like I, I, those kind of moves, I don't get. Mel Tucker has one good season at Michigan State. He gets extended. Yep. And I don't get the Mel Tucker situation. I know Kim Colorado. He did have a winning record in Colorado in the first place. No. And you gave the man like a big huge extension. Yeah, I'm just hoping Arizona. If Arizona does extend him, they don't go fall down that rabbit hole because I know they're kind of not in a good financial state right now with the move to the big 12 next year. Uh, they have looking to cut some sports. Uh, hopefully, you know, they do give an extension, you know, it's enough money for them. If they need to, you know, buy them out for some ever reason they can, it's not what Texas A&M is doing right now. 70 million, Indiana, 15.5 million to Tom Allen to send his couch for another year. So I don't know, Mark, I hope Arizona doesn't do that. I'm hoping they, you know, they could just be a consistent program next year in the Big 12, you know, contend maybe for a Big 12 championship. I hear you. All right, Defiant. Anything else? No, but that was my last thing I wanted to bring up, bring up to you, Mark. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mark. All right, folks. Uh, again, it's the beginning of the shakeup because... When you think about it, the dominoes fall. The dominoes leave another spot open. So every time somebody leaves, meaning Dana Hogerson's gone, Houston's got to replace him. They replace him with a coach. They left somewhere. 
that job's got to be replaced and on and on and on and on. And really the only thing that stops the dominoes is the hiring from within. Because I, for one, don't follow the comings and goings of running back coaches. So it never stops really anywhere, but I don't follow that level of coaching changes unless you know, if we've got our Auburn guy here, or our Kansas State guy, or our UCLA guy, they want to talk about the running back position or the linebacker coach. That's one thing. We, st we stick right here with the head coaches and the coordinators. And so Houston is looking for a new head coach. And whether that comes from Texas San Antonio or Tulane, then they're going to need a new head coach. Indiana's looking for a new head coach after firing Tom Allen. And Mississippi State has filled its spot with Jeff Lebby leaving Oklahoma. So now the Sooners are looking for an OC. Texas A&M, of course, Mike Elko. So now Duke, Houston, Indiana, all looking for head coaches. And UCLA could be next. Our Big Ten Live show comes your way every Monday night. So we are just one night away from the Big Ten Live show. And of course, that will include the Iowa-Michigan breakdown on the Big Ten Live show at 6 p.m. Eastern time on Monday night. My top 25, that actually makes sense. Check it out. Those videos are only like two and a half minutes long. Give it a look. Let me know what you think. We've got, uh, as you can see on the screen, a Big 12 channel that launched at the beginning of the season. Please check it out. The link's in the description section. Here's the deal. We would want you to subscribe to the Big 12 channel because you enjoy what we offer there. But if you just enjoy what we do here at the Voice of College Football and could care less about the Big 12, you know what? Subscribe anyway. That helps build the entire deal. We need 1,000 subscribers at the Big 12 channel. Same thing for the SEC channel. We have a lot of work to do to get the SEC channel and the Big 12 channel where they should be. The links are in the description section right at the top. Subscribe to the Big 12 channel. Subscribe to the SEC channel. We appreciate it. Uh, big day at the Voice of College Football on Monday. Again, the Big Ten Live show is at 6, USC at 11. And if there is coaching news, I will be here with all of you. I am working on breakdowns of all the conference championship games. So be looking out for those. I just posted a video on the Miami channel. Give it a look. You might uh, smirk or chuckle or maybe bust out laughing or be mad at me. One of those. Michigan predictions are coming in from Stone Cold and Ralph Wolf, 38-3 Michigan, 34-3 Michigan. Okay. Amazon links in the description section of all the videos, and especially this time of year when you're shopping online for Christmas, please use the Amazon link that we provide. Same shopping experience. If it's not, come tell me about it. If it's not, then just go grab your other link that you usually use, and then come tell me about it. Because otherwise, out of everyone has used the Amazon link, same shopping experience. So please use the link that we provide. Put it somewhere where you won't forget it. And again, we've got a big day at the Voice of College Football. And College Football After Dark is taking over here soon in about an hour and a half here on the main channel. Moose is doing a heck of a job in the chat, let it, letting everyone know about what we've got available here at the Voice of College Football. He's got Ticket Smarter. Get your tickets right there. Best place on the secondary market. Promo code is BIG for $10 off of a purchase of at least $100. BIG20 for 20 bucks off. So if you're looking to go to a bowl game, And want some money off, then there you go. Ticketsmarter.com or any event, any event out there. And what's great about that promo code is that you can use it over and 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 over. Yes. 
And uh, we also have our line of merch. And uh, did I tell you about the Amazon link? Okay. All right. Appreciate y'all being here at the Voice of College Football. I'm going to get to work on some videos. I am going to be breaking down all the conference championship games. And I'm guessing by the time I wake up, there's going to be three more coaches fired. Or maybe some of these coaching spots filled. Something. Something's coming up again very quickly, very shortly. Black Sunday. The dominoes are falling. The coaching carousel is on the move. Appreciate you all being here at the Boys for College Football. Keep it right here, 90 minutes away from college football after dark. <laughs>